Good morning and welcome to Cornerstone. It's good to see you all come out today to worship with us. And uh, it's been a whirlwind of the last couple weeks for sure. It's hard to keep up with what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. But I just praise God that we are still able to come and meet and be healthy. And uh, I just pray that as we worship today that God would speak to you in a special way. If you could stand now as we sing. Father, we come before you this morning in worship, and we just pray, Father, that you would be here with us, and, and as we hear your message, Father, that we would leave this place and, and apply that to our lives, and not only to our lives, Father, that we would reach out into our community and spread the, the good news that we have in us to those around us, and that we would uh, just be your light in this, this time of Christmas season, Father. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. <laughs> Yes. 
This is Christmas. This is Jesus, Emmanuel, here with us. Tell all the world we have a Savior. We have a Savior. We are no longer lost because He has come down for us. We have a Savior. your voices, join in the song of hope, this is Christmas, this is Jesus, Emmanuel, here with us, tell all the world, we have a Savior, we have a Savior. you would 
Good morning, everybody. It is so good to have everyone here this morning worshiping. It is such a privilege to be able to be here and worship this morning. Um, the Fairview bylaw came off this week, so we don't have to wear masks in church. But just really, uh, you know, our, um, our, our people in leadership are trying to keep the health care system from being overloaded. So... As God's people, let's uh, respect that. Let's keep our distance uh, this morning. I need to uh, get out of my old habits too, so we all need to work on that. And it's just to protect our healthcare system and that we don't run back into trouble again. So appreciate your cooperation in that for, for COVID. So it's really good to be here to worship this morning. And we are going to start the Advent uh, uh 
first advent this morning and we're going to be looking forward to the the, the coming of our lord and celebrating the nativity um and so we're going to have a short video allison's got a video here to introduce advent and uh, then zacchaeus and shay will come and bring the first reading could and zacchaeus could you use that mic right there okay waiting. The action of staying where one is. Time passing. Expecting something to happen until one day it does. Advent is a time of waiting, of hope, of anticipation. God tells us in Galatians that when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Advent is the church in waiting, the church's yearly reminder each December of what Christians worldwide anticipate in the days before Christmas. We wait for Christmas as Israel waited centuries for a savior, for God to fulfill his covenant. They waited for a virgin son to Abraham's line, a descendant of Isaac, Jacob, and David, for a branch from the rod of Jesse, for a baby born in Bethlehem, called Emmanuel. For generations, God's people waited for the fulfillment of countless Old Testament prophecies of a savior who would light this world brighter than any Magi star. Jesus was the long awaited hope to a dark and sinful world. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. As Christians wait for the light of Christmas, the four Advent candles are lit with each week's passing, and blue decorates the altar to receive our King with hope. But we know that our hoping and waiting doesn't stop at Christmas, because He's coming back on the last day, a second Advent. So as we hope for Christmas, we continue to wait and pray for our Savior to come again. So today we will light the first purple candle, known as the Prophet's Candle. Imagine the eager waiting and longing for the appearance of God's chosen one. The people of Israel experienced two serious disappointments in their long history. These disappointments led them to hope and believe that God would send his Messiah, the chosen one, to make things right. After the time of David and Solomon, very few of the kings in Israel measured up to God's ideal. Many prophets saw that in this human failure, the need for a divine kingship. Though the, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they proclaimed that a special king sent directly from God would soon appear. The, the people, people in, in, in darkness, darkness have, have seen, seen a great light of those living, living in the land of the shadow of the death. Of death. A light has dawned. For, for to us a child is born, born to us a son is given, and the, and the government, government will be on his shoulders, and he will, will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, <laughs> Everlasting Father, Father, and Prince, Prince of Peace. After being taken into captivity, into captivity and separated from their homeland, the people of Israel felt their hope slipping away, even from enemy soil. However, God's prophets continued to proclaim his plan for the future. The bold and courageous words of Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Ezekiel kept the embers of hope alive, and the despairing exiles, oops, that was, <laughs> they were given hope, <laughs> but they were told to wait. God's time was not their time, and so they waited and longed for a Messiah their special king to appear. Thank you, Zacchaeus and Shay, for sharing that with us, lighting that first candle. You know, I heard <clears throat> a, um, a presentation of what uh, the Advent was about in three points, and I wanted to share that with you this morning. Uh, number one, Jesus has come. 
And um, that's what we are getting ready to remember as we approach Christmas, that the Savior of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, left heaven, and he came to earth to be like us, and he went to the cross and died to take away our sin. That's so amazing that we will forever rejoice for God's provision to us to take away our sin, that we could come back into that relationship with him again. And number two, Jesus is coming again. <clears throat> that is so exciting. That's what we've been talking about as a church over the last few weeks is the coming, second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming again. And, um, you know, the rapture, the, the uh, tribulation, the uh, second coming of Christ, and the millennial reign are events that we as God's people get to look forward to. Um, and that could happen any time, any time, any time. Boom, it's, it's here. And so we need to be ready for that. We need to be excited about that. He's coming again. And number three, Jesus Christ is here with us now. That's so amazing. <clears throat> he rose from the dead. He's not dead. He rose from the dead. And alive today, sitting at the Father's right hand, interceding for us. That's so awesome. His death and resurrection has totally stripped Satan of his power. I thought of this song's been ringing through me this week. Uh, Jeremy Camp, I think he wrote this. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Everyone overcome. And that comes from Revelation 12, 10 to 11. And it says, and they have defeated him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. That's the way we need to be today. Not afraid to die. We have such a wonderful hope and future. We can go out in the world and show people joy and hope. And um, they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb. When Jesus died on the cross, he stripped Satan completely of his power. He has no power. And by their testimony, that means that we can share the word of God with people. Uh, we can share our testimony with people. We can tell people, how come we have such great hope in our lives? That's, that's what we can do today. Nice to be with you again this morning. I... Uh this whole COVID thing has brought a lot of interesting dialogue. I was getting texts late into the night, or late last night from pastors who are uh, still wondering how to work it out. And uh, boy, what a, how shall I say, interruption to our world. And uh, that's a great segue because I'm gonna talk about interruptions today. <laughs> this week, I had a plan to get a lot done. I had a plan to, uh, you know, get a lot done on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. And uh, Wednesday night, I got notified that uh, plans had changed for Friday and Saturday. And I have to admit, I was chafed. I was a little bit ticked off by that. <laughs> I didn't want any interruptions. I had an agenda that I was going to fulfill. And uh, I had to wrestle with this whole thing of interruptions. And so I want to talk about that today as we think about the Christmas story. I appreciate the Advent reading. I just love the Christmas season. It's my favorite time of the year. And uh, so I'm glad to be here to speak to you today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, now as we focus in on uh, your word, we ask that your spirit would move in me, through me, and in our hearts, I pray. Amen. Interruptions. Did you know that much of the Christmas story unfolds because of interruptions? I'm going to notify or talk about a few of those interruptions this morning, 
And then there's a bigger lesson that comes from it all, I trust that will encourage you as we are living in a season of interruption in our world. The first interruption I want to point out is simply this. God interrupts our resignations. By that I mean there are things that we have resigned ourselves to, hopes that we have lost, that he interrupts. And we see this in the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. In Luke chapter 1, you can go to the book of Luke, and we're going to read a few passages from there, also some from Matthew chapter 2. But I want to read Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 5. A little bit of the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. In the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of the Lord, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. And once when Zechariah's division was on duty, he was serving as a priest before God. He was chosen by lot according to the temple of the Lord and, and burn incense. And when the time of the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many people of the people of Israel to the Lord and their God, and he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of parents to their children and disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people that prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words which will come true at their appointed time. Now, I want you to drop into Zechariah and Elizabeth's world for a little bit. Here we have a couple that has walked with God their life. They are a godly couple. They've married the right people. They've lived righteously. They have served faithfully all their life. And yet they have no children. And as you likely know, that that was really a sign of disgrace in those days and often viewed as God's disfavor. So we have people who've lived their life to favor God, but the message probably that they get from people in their community is there's something wrong with you. Are you sure there's not a sin in your life? And now the time has passed. Their prayers for a child have gone unanswered day after day, month after month, year after year, praying for a child, no child. And now they've resigned themselves to their fate. But God interrupted. Zechariah is fulfilling his duties. As a priest, and the angel Gabriel drops into the picture and gives him this message. And Zechariah has resigned himself so much he starts arguing. By the way, Gabriel says your prayers, the tense is your prayers that you no longer pray, have been answered. They had resigned themselves to childlessness, but God interrupted. That interruption showed that God was on the move. Some of you may have served God with all your heart for a long time. And there's a disappointment that you've resigned yourself to. 
And it may be that you're called to live by faith through this heartache. However, God reserves the right to interrupt your resignations. To break into your world. That's one of the ways he interrupts. God also interrupts our good plans. In uh, verse 26 of Luke chapter 1, we see in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel Gabriel to Nazareth to a town of Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings to you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end, and it goes on. But I want to say that God also interrupts our good plans. Did any of you have good plans in place before COVID hit? I had a lot of good plans. I had a whole year's worth of plans. My schedule was packed, and I was excited in a day all interrupted, really. God interrupts our good plans. Mary was planning a wedding to a wonderful, godly man. Marriage is a good thing. I don't know if any of you would like, when you were getting ready for your wedding, if you would like to have it all interrupted. Planning a family is a good thing. Planning a wedding is a good thing and a bad time to be interrupted. Joseph had found a virtuous woman to be his wife. She had favor with God. The plans were in place. It was all coming together. Everything was fitting in just as it should be. But the angel messengers interrupted their good plans. The wedding was off. There was an unexpected trip. There was unexpected questions and shame in the community. Sometimes God interrupts our good plans. And he's got something else going on. Have you had your good plans interrupted in this last while? God interrupts our work. If you look in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 um, to 20, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, watching over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, as the Savior has been born to you, he is the Messiah, the Lord. There will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. When the angels had left, they said, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. And you know they went and they worshipped. The shepherds were faithfully doing their work. They were keeping vigilance on the night shift. It was a time to watch for predators, for the wolves, for the bears, for the lions who would come and eat their sheep. They were doing what they were called to do. They were doing their work. Everything was as it should be, but God interrupted the angel interrupted them and sent them on a quest. It was time to leave their work and go and worship the Savior. Sometimes God interrupts our work. I know a lot of people have had their work interrupted in this time. E. Stanley Jones, who was a missionary in India, said, we plan our work and then people upset those plans. Have you ever found that? That's what happened to me this week. And us, we say our work is spoiled. It may, and then he says, it may be but that those very interruptions are our work. Jesus made them so. Some of his finest teaching, his finest deeds, the revelation of his finest spirit came out of some person or some circumstance interrupting or upsetting his plans. These interruptions did not upset his plans. They sent his grace off in new angles. Have you ever thought of your interruptions like that? a chance to send God's grace in new angles. The shepherd's work was interrupted, yet it was part of God's purpose. 
We also see, and you can turn back to the book of Matthew now, Matthew chapter 2, that God interrupts our delusions. In Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, the time of King Herod the Magi, of Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who's been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Now Herod was the king. Herod was a nasty piece of work. Anybody who threatened his throne was dealt with. So just to give you a couple of examples, there was some young fellow that apparently was gaining popularity. And uh, so Herod arranged a swimming party down at the Jordan and uh, arranged for this threat to his throne to be held under the water just a little bit too long. Herod also had uh, his wife, his favorite wife, and sons killed to protect his office. So this was a man who thought he was king who was living under the delusion that he could keep that kingship for as long as he wanted. And actually, he was very sick at this time, but he was still living under that delusion. But he was disturbed by the rumor of this little child. Sometimes we think we are something when we are not, and God interrupts our delusions of being king and ruling and being in control of our lives. Simple questions and rumors of the new king can take us out of these false conclusions and invite us to encounter the king. The movie Titanic, the main actor, stretches himself out in front of the ship and shouts, I'm the king of the world! Of course, Titanic was billed as the unsinkable ship until it hit that iceberg. Oh, there's an interruption. Thanks for illustrating my point today. (laughs) But God interrupted that delusion, that delusion. You know, one thing that's happened in our world with COVID is this. God has interrupted the delusion of many people in the world that they are invulnerable. Rich, poor, the mighty, the helpless, are all getting the message, you are vulnerable. You are not the king of your world. That's one of the things God's doing right now in the world. I'm going to comment on that a little bit more. But God interrupts our delusions as he interrupted King Herod. And God interrupts evil plans. I know that there are many Christians very upset in the world right now. I'm on the internet. I hear the comments. I listen to people. And they're upset because it seems evil plans are going uninterrupted in our world. And I want to read for you Matthew 2, 3 to 13, where it says, When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. And for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found them from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him too. And after they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that had seen them, they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until they stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened the treasures and presented him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. And when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, take the child and his mother, 
and escape to Egypt, for there are, there are, and stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Now I want to say, again, I hear many Christians very upset about the evil plans going on in our world. And I do believe that there are. But I also want to enter this thought that God will use interruptions to hold them back. Wherever he wants to stop them, he will use interruptions to hold them back. Herod became a willing pawn of the satanic effort to kill the sa savior of, wor of the world. He attempted to use the seat to trick the wise men. He sent an assassination to, uh, team to Bethlehem. He ruthlessly perceived pursued the threat to his throne, but God interrupted. God interrupted the satanic plot. And so he warned the wise men to return another way. He warned Joseph and Mary in a dream to flee to Egypt. The satanic plot to kill the Savior was thwarted. God interrupted the evil plot. And because of the interruption, you and I have a Savior because of that. So my thought is, this is what I want to apply to you today. The interruptions of God work out the purposes of God. God breaks into our world with divinely intended interruptions. The first Christmas was a Christmas of interruptions. Zachariah and Elizabeth had their resignation interrupted. Joseph and Mary, their good plans interrupted. The shepherds have their work interrupted. Herod has his delusion interrupted. And Satan had his plot to kill a savior interrupted. All the interruptions of that first Christmas brought about the purposes of God to bring salvation to the world. And it was through, self, through these interruptions that God broke into our world. And there was one interruption that I haven't mentioned yet. Think of the interruption in heaven when Jesus came to earth. You see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying and longing for the glory that he had in heaven. It was through that interruption that you and I have a Savior. Zechariah and Elizabeth's child would make the way for the Savior. Joseph and Mary were interrupted so they could make a home for the Savior. The shepherds were interrupted and teach us to welcome the Savior. Herod was interrupted to teach us the nature of the Savior. He is Lord. And as was mentioned, he's coming back. Satan was interrupted to preserve the life of the Savior. And Jesus was interrupted in his heavenly glory so that you and I could have a Savior. Every interruption played a part in the purposes of God to bring salvation to the world. Let me ask you, how do you view the interruptions that you have? Is it possible that God could be working out higher purposes? Is it possible that it could be used to bring Christ into our lives in ways that we would never have thought of or seen. A good friend of mine called me one night. He was 60 years old. And uh, I think it was just shortly before he was going for a double lung transplant. And his life had been interrupted. He was a healthy and vital a man with vitality, but he said this, I never read the Bible as accurately as I do now. God used that interruption to break into his heart in a whole new way. And I want to say this, since I've been alive, so I'm going to be turning 57 here in a couple of weeks. You probably thought it was 67. All my life I've been rated as older than I actually am. Fifty-seven years, I've never seen an interruption in the whole world like we are having right now. 
Does it make you wonder? Does it make you wonder what God may be up to? You uh, mentioned this guy in the parking lot that you talked to this week. A couple of weeks ago, I was speaking in a different church, and some people just showed up out of the blue. They were seeking, they were looking. I read last night, uh, Franklin Graham was saying about their ministry outreach. Last year in 2019, through all their efforts, I don't know how they keep track of this, but they thought... 1.3 million people opened their hearts to Christ the Savior through the ministry last year. This year, it's 1.7. He said there's a softening of hearts that is going on. May that be the case. And so we view COVID as this great interruption, and it is. I don't enjoy it. But could it be that God is up to something big? Could it be? So I encourage you to view your interruptions as possibly having a higher purpose. And I encourage you to pray that the interruption that's happening or happening all around the world will have a great powerful effect of drawing and seeing people open their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. The message is going out. People are realizing their vulnerability. Pray that they would open their hearts. The interruptions of God work out the purposes of God. And he's doing that in your life. He's doing that right here in Fairview, as has been testified. So this week, when you get interruption... Maybe think of it a little differently. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you were interrupted so that we could be saved. I pray for anyone here who may not have opened their heart to you as Lord and Savior, that you would uh, let them know of the invitation, the opportunity that's awaiting them. Thank you for all the work you are doing in the world right now. We see the evil plans, we see difficult things, we see restrictions, we see vulnerabilities, we see all kinds of things. But help us by faith to see your hidden hand at work, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, Lyndon. That was an awesome message to hear today, and how fitting in our world today as we, as we go through all of these struggles and trials that... There is a focus that we can keep our eyes on that gives us great hope. Could you stand and join us as we sing our last song today?
for coming and joining us today in worship. And that last song, Let There Be Peace and Let It Start in Me. I just pray that as we leave here today, that we would uh, in, in just think about that this week, is everything we do and say, that it can start in us if we bring peace. Because of Jesus, we have a hope that uh, we can spread throughout our community. So thank you for coming. Have a, have a great week. Stay healthy, and I hope to see you back here next week. God bless.